Turn with me to Matthew chapter number 16 this morning. Matthew 16, verse number 18. I'm going to go back to verse 13. I always like to start here when I'm reading this. I've been to Caesarea Philippi. It's quite a place. Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 13. This is the infallible word of God, folks. That's right. Anything less and it's all a joke. Amen. Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Father, bless this holy book now, and give me unction to preach it. In thy name I pray, amen. How privileged I am. How privileged I am. Sometimes I am overwhelmed with the fact that God has chosen an old junkyard dog and called him by the grace of God to preach his word and now put him to pastoring the church of the living God. How gracious he is. He is the builder of his church in Matthew 16, verse 18. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church. The Greek word translated church is ekklesia. And the word ekklesia means an assembly that's called out. It could be a drunken mob in the street, or it could be the assembly of the firstborn. That, of course, is who we are. We are members of the church of the firstborn. The calling out will be consummated when he comes at the second advent and shouts our names to meet him in the clouds and in the air. Then we truly will be called out of this world. We've already been separated from it. He's made a clear demarcation, a line of demarcation, for he has marked those that belong to him and those that don't. If you have the Holy Ghost in you, you've been sealed Amen. by the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. Amen. You belong to the Lord and not yourself anymore. Amen. And every time that you say the word Lord, remember, Lord and Master means that he owns you. Lock, stock, and barrel. He's the Lord God Almighty. His Lordship is questioned today. Men deny it and doubt it. But the fact of the matter is that not so much as a sparrow can fly through the air lest God give him that, that ability to move about and eat and find its shelter. He's the Lord in the sense that he upholds all things by the word of his power. And my friend, if he's your Lord this morning, then you know your purpose in life, you know why you're here, and you know where you're going. He's the Lord. He said, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? You won't fool God with lip service. I know you probably charm all the people around you, but you'll never charm God. He seeks the inward man. He looks at the inward parts. And as David cried out in Psalm chapter number 51, thou knowest the inward parts, and he does know what makes us tick and all about it. So upon this rock, he said, I'll build my church. He didn't say, I'll build my organization. He didn't say, I'll build my movement. He didn't say, I'll build my government. He said, I'll build my church. And he said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hallelujah. I'm so glad today that I belong to the church of God. And I'm glad today, folks, that regardless of how men feel about me and what happens to me in this world, you can't get me out of it. Amen. Hallelujah. Because you didn't put me in there. God Almighty by his Holy Ghost did that. For by one spirit we all baptized into one body. That one body that Paul talks about in Ephesians 4. One church, one faith, one baptism, one body. 
Lord over all, my friend. I've been put into that body by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. It happened one night, folks. i got to tell you. It happened one night when I bowed my head. I, I was a guilty sinner on my road to hell. And when I raised up my head, I wasn't the same anymore. Something had happened inside my soul. I was not initiated into religion. I met God. I came face to face with this one that said, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail again. I'm glad, thank God, that I'm in his church. It's a good to go to bed at night and lay your head on the pillow, not know whether you'll ever wake up that next morning. I know where I'm going and I know whom I have believed. I'm fully persuaded he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. My soul is not in my hands. My soul is in his hands. My life is in his hands. I breathe because he breathes. I live because he lives. Amen. And if the church of God is built upon a foundation like that, it makes all the difference in the world. I do not look to this world for anything. And I certainly don't seek its counsel. The wisdom of God and the understanding of what you are and where you're from and what you're here for is in that sacred, blessed book I hold in my hands right there. That is the living word of the living God. Amen. Everything else, my friend, is a lie if it tries to contradict that sacred book. So he said, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to use a few churches this morning as an illustration of what he's talking about over here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14 and verse number 26 we read these words how is it then brethren when you come together every one of you hath a psalm hath a doctrine hath a tongue hath a revelation hath an interpretation let all things be done unto edifying now you know who he's talking about he's talking about the church at Corinth the church at Corinth was filled with people who wanted spiritual things. They were so hungry for spiritual things. Uh, but you won't find one place where they were ever hungry for God. My friend, don't you think that's quite a thing? They wanted gifts because as, uh, as Simon Magnus in the book of Acts, give me this gift that I might buy it, that I might be able to do this or do that. In other words, manipulate by my own power. And so in the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul told him in 1 Corinthians 12, he said, seek ye earnestly the best gifts. But let me explain to you what's going on about the gifts. The church at Corinth was full of confusion. You had those who loved God and those who were foolish. You had those who loved the Lord and those who were fornicating. You had those who sincerely sought the face of God, and but you had many, 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 many who were so selfish. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number one, he said, some of you say I'm a Paul. Some of you say I'm of Cephas. Some of you say I'm of Apollos. Some of you say I'm of Christ. He said, what is it that's going on with you? You have set yourself up as, 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 as dictators inside the church. And so here in the book of 1 Corinthians, he makes it plain to them, you are confused. The Bible talks about a single eye. And if the eye be single, you understand what you're in this world for today. I'm here today because my life is to be lived out for the glory of God. I'm not here to live for myself. I'm here to live for God because he owns me. Folks, don't let Temple Baptist Church, <coughs> don't ever let Temple Baptist Church become confused. We know who we are, what we believe, where we came from, and where we're going. When you walk into this house, you know what to expect. You know what we are. And my friend, this is what's going on in 1 Corinthians. They don't know what they are. Everything in the world can fly in that place. In the book of Galatians, chapter number 3 and verse 1, the apostle said to the church of Galatia, he said, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you? The church at Galatia was a bewitched church. A bewitched church. What is a bewitched church, preacher? It's a church that takes away from the power of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It may come across as moral. It may come across as benevolent. It may come across as compassionate. It may come across with all this stuff. But if you touch the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have created a bewitched hellhole. In other words, if you try to marry law and grace, it won't work. The apostle Paul had to open their eyes to grace. 
He had to tell the church at Galatia, he said, listen, the reason the law was given was to condemn you, was to point out your faults and to bring you to Christ. It was a schoolmaster to teach you that regardless of how hard you try, you can't make it, you can't meet the standard, but some of you in this house today are still trying, and you've got your standard and your list, and you measure everybody by that list and by that standard, and what you don't realize is that by the grace of God I am who I am. So my friend, Satan can bewitch you if you ever take your eyes off of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. One day you'll fall and you'll fall hard and we'll hear you as you bounce off of the spiritual bottom. For when you set up this great superstructure of morality and righteousness and goodness, it will ultimately destroy you. For the day will come when you'll come face to face with reality and realize that you've been living a lie from day one. If you say you have no sin, he said in 1 John chapter number 1, you make him a liar. And that has nothing to do with somebody you're trying to get right with God. It's somebody, some old dog that came into the church and you want to get them right that are backslidden. That's where most Baptists apply that scripture. That scripture applies to all of us. And when we come to God, we come to him understanding that in me dwelleth no good thing. Lord, give me mercy. Give me grace. Cleanse me. Let me face my problems and my ills and my weaknesses. And by the grace of God, I am who I am. And then you can move from Romans chapter number 7 where you are condemned to Romans chapter number 8 where you walk in the spirit of the life of Christ Jesus. Hallelujah to God. Folks, if you thought that this preacher thought for a minute that I was perfect in order to get up in front of you and preach today, you're sadly mistaken. But my friend, this preacher is up in front of you preaching this morning because the blood of Christ cleansed me in that office and the blood of Christ cleansed me again right here and the blood of Christ cleansed me again when I open his word. Now when I walk out of this house today, I'll plead the blood throughout the day. Amen. Because I got to keep my eyes on Jesus or I'll fall. I can't make it. I won't make it. But to the church at Galatia, many of them never got that lesson. And many of our legalistic brethren don't get that lesson. And I am not giving you a license to sin. I'm telling you how to live a life where you've got victory over sin. And the only way to get victory over sin is to drag it out of the darkness, bring it before Christ, cover it by the blood, and get victory over it. There's only one way to do that. That is to acknowledge it, get victory over it, and then you receive spiritual strength to get power over it, and it doesn't continue to drag you down, drag you down, drag you down, and defeat you in your spiritual life. How many of you have a besetting sin today that just keeps, keeps, keeps eating, eating, gnawing, dragging, and as much as you come against it and as much as you pray about it, it's still there, still there, still there. That's what we're talking about. And there's no way that you're going to make your mind up and you're going to pull up yourself with your bootstraps and you're just going to overcome it. That's trying to do it by the arm of the flesh. The only way you'll ever overcome that besetting sin is acknowledge it and bring it into the light of Christ and cover it by the blood. And say, Lord Jesus, I need something from you. I need something more from you that I don't have. I need power from you to overcome this sin. I need power from you. I need your grace. I need your strength. Lord Jesus, give me victory. And then claim it and receive it. And you'd be amazed at how something like that will help your Christian life. If the church of Philippi was a cutthroat church, Philippians chapter number one, verses 15 through 18. Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. 
The Apostle Paul said to the church at Philippi, some supposed to add affliction to my bonds. What a wicked motive. The motive behind will be the judgment at the judgment seat of Christ. This church at Philippi had some real deep-seated problems. If I am preaching to glorify myself and build my name and make some kind of a reputation for myself, you'll see at the judgment seat of Christ when he calls my name. By the way, I'll be there. Hallelujah to God. I'm not going to be at the great white throne. I'll be at the judgment seat of Christ. That's where he judges his saints. And when they call my name and all this great superstructure of works and accomplishments and deeds that will be laid out for the whole world to see and everybody stands in awe, my goodness, look at what a building he built. Look at what a church he built. Look at what a movement he started. Look how great he was. Look at this. Look at that. And then the Lord Jesus Christ sits on that beam of that judgment seat and he compares it to holiness and righteousness and judges the motives. You'll see it burn up like straw. You'll see it consumed before your very eyes. My at the shocked faces, my at the fallen countenance, when their great hero stands at the judgment seat of Christ and everything he's done literally goes up in flames. That's what it's about, folks. And that's what he's going to judge us for. Not what you accomplish, your motive behind it. You may wind up your life as a minister of the gospel preaching to 15 people. You may finish your ministry on the mission field with somebody hitting you in the back of the head like Marjorie Browning and dying on the mission field. You may wind up somewhere that is the most obscure, unknown place you could imagine, but wait until the judgment seat of Christ. When that little widow brought that mite and she dropped it into the plate, the Lord Jesus said, that woman hath given more than all the rest. And those who judge by appearance and judge by, 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 by what's worth in the, in the sense of man, they said, how can this be? Does not the master know that that's only a mite? And we've had those who have given shekels and they've given silver and they've given gold. My goodness, Lord, you don't build your church on a widow's mite. And he said, you don't understand. She gave everything she had. It just happened to be a mite. It could have been a million mites. It could have been a billion mites. The point is she gave everything she had. And when she walked out of that house, she didn't know where her next meal was coming from. She didn't know what was going to happen to her. But she knew the one that fed her is the one that feeds the sparrow. That, my friend, will show up in the judgment seat of Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. In the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 8, this is the hungry church. For you were sometimes darkness, but now are you light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable to the Lord, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. These are people in the book of Ephesians that he revealed more to in two or three chapters than he did in two or three books. Yeah. To the church at Ephesus, he talked about the body of Christ and how that it is a sign in the spiritual world, how that he takes from a dunghill and he puts in the king's palace. How that from the foundation of the world, he had already established what he was going to do about the problem of sin. Before he ever made the first man in the mind of God, he had the end completed in the beginning. In the book of Ephesians, he begins to reveal the mysteries of the kingdom and of the grace of God. And to the church at Ephesus, therefore, they must have had some great blessing from God to be able to receive all of these great spiritual truths. Oh, hallelujah, I like to shout. Glory to God, I love to feel good. I love the move of the Holy Ghost. And God, I pray that he doesn't ever take it away from us. Now, folks, there's more than that. There's more to it than that. That's the good part. That's like the cream. That's like the, that's like the icing on the cake. We all love that part. Hallelujah. But get in the Word of God and begin to grow. And get yourself rooted and grounded in the faith. And then the more you shout, it might be a little higher. The pitch may be a little clearer. The mountain may be a little steeper. And the, and the wind as it blows a little cooler. And when you get up there, you'll begin to realize, boy, it's still good to get on top of this mountain and praise God. 
but I know a little bit more about what's down in the valley. And I know a little bit more about how I got up here. And I know a little bit more what to expect when I start going back down off this mountain. Because I can't stay on the mountain. And a lot of folks try to, and I wish we could. But that's not life. It's in the valley you grow. It's when the wind blows that that tree puts its roots deeper into the ground. It's when that metal is tempered. Tempered, you melt it to make it, but you temper it to strengthen it. You heat it to a certain degree and it's stronger. And that's what he's doing for you. Some of you, he's tempering. He's tempering. And that's okay. That's good. That's where you grow. Hallelujah to God. You can always tell when a church has become heady and high-minded and their head's all swollen up. When I was a kid, we called it the big head. You know what the big wig is, don't you? When the English came to this country, they set up the judicial system like they had there. They, they put wigs on. Over there, they had wigs on. Now, I suppose the bigger the wig, the bigger the man. I don't know. But they had big wigs. They called them big wig. Well, we had big heads. And uh, you can always tell when somebody's got a big head, he doesn't shout as loud. He doesn't cry as much. There's not a whole lot of glory moving in his soul. Everything's becoming intellectual with him. Lord, don't let that happen to us. I don't want this place to become a big, a bunch of big-headed uh, intellectualists. No, my friend. We're no, no, no. The, the, listen, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. 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 Now in Colossians chapter number 2 and verse 18, he said, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. This is the New Age church. What do you mean New Age? They're worshiping angels. The churches are New Age today. They're full of New Age churches. And you know, I've never decided, I don't know what, they, what it is. I don't understand what's going on so much here. But the more, the more light we get in this place, the better it is as far as I'm concerned. It'd be all right if we opened up the roof right there, just had a big thing pulled back and the sun would shine in. Hallelujah. Amen. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You ever notice a lot of these churches you go into how dark they are? You ever noticed it? It's dark, stumbling around. You can't see 15 feet. And all the focus is on whoever's standing up here. They've got some light focused on it, but everything else is dark. You ever notice a witch's coven? You ever, you ever seen photographs of a witch's coven? It's not the sun shining in there. It's dark. It's lit up with a bunch of candles, and they've got this, and they've got that in there. But they don't want any light. I love light. I love light in my soul. I love light. Amen. If you're going to grow anything, you better have some light. Amen. You can't grow anything in darkness except mold. New Age churches are full of darkness. And then finally, there's this one in 1 Thessalonians 1. Uh, this is one of my favorite churches. Chapter number 4, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verse 13. Listen to this. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. I don't know if you know this or not. One of the biggest cemeteries in this town is right here within a stone's throw of us. Some of you don't know that. Just walk out in the field. Walk out there right now, too, especially, too, in the wintertime before all everything blooms. And just look out through there. And I've been into that graveyard, Lord, I don't know how many times. I have no idea. Many, many times I've been in that graveyard and had, and had uh, funeral services. Been out there. And I know a lot of those, uh, a lot of the people, their bodies, I know. I know where they are. My goodness, I could spend a week, I guess, if I just went from one graveyard to the next, to the places I've been, places that didn't even know exist. There are graveyards around here, folks, that, you, that people don't even know exist. I know of one graveyard, if you get on John Sevier Highway and start driving down it, it's up on the top of a hill, sits back, there's no markers anywhere, but they've, gr they've got graves up there that date back to the Revolutionary War. There's graves everywhere. God knows where every one of them is. He knows they don't make any difference if there's a mark on it or not. He knows where they are. He knows them. He knows his home. He knows them. And the Bible said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. So the Lord wants to tell us something about those that have gone home. How many have gone on just in the last few months, in the last two or three years? How many folks have we got in this house today that are widows, that have lost husbands and wives and children? There's at the end of that pew down through there somewhere it says Betty Dawn. Most of, how many of you know who Betty Dawn is? All right, good, about half. Betty Dawn was a precious young woman. She had Frederick's ataxia. 
That's something like muscular st uh, uh, sc uh, sclerosis. It was a debilitating, wasting away disease of her muscular structure in her body. And when she came to us, she was, she was already advanced in it. But the day came when Betty Dawn died. And she no longer sat here on the end of the pew. She was gone from us. We took her out in Sevier County, and I remember the graveyard. It's on the right-hand side of the road. I remember going down there and putting her little body in the ground. I remember when Betty Dawn left this old world, not to come back anymore to this world the way it is right now. But God knows where that grave is. He knows exactly where it is. Exactly. And the Bible says the day is going to come when the heavens roll back like a scroll. The Bible said heaven shall be opened and he was coming will be on a white horse. A white horse he's coming in power and glory. He's, the apostle Paul gives you the second advent in 1 Thessalonians 4. I want you to notice what he says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. Look at chapter number 1 in verse number 10. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, he said to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19. For what is our hope or our rejoicing or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? Would look at chapter number 3 and verse 13. To the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Have you noticed a pattern? Chapter number 4 and verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then look at chapter number 5 and verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's not another book in the whole Bible laid out like this. Every single chapter in 1 Thessalonians makes a reference to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Every one of them. And we have every reason to believe that the book of 1 Thessalonians was the first book written in the canon of Scripture. Before many Christians ever saw Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they saw 1 Thessalonians. Before long, before they ever saw the book of Revelation, they saw 1 Thessalonians. And the burden of 1 Thessalonians is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wanted the early church to understand that in the mind of God, the most important thing is the fact that he said, I will come again and receive you into myself that where I am, there you may be also. He's coming again. He's coming again. M. R. Dahan's grave said, maybe today, maybe today, maybe today. M. R. Dahan was a physician, got saved, and he can, when he got saved, he dropped being a, 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 a doctor, and he picked up preaching of the Word of God. He's the one who wrote the book about the blood, the chemistry of the blood. You ought to read it sometime. It's an amazing book, The Chemistry of the Blood, M. R. DeHaan. And on his tombstone it says, maybe today, maybe today. He was one of those old saints that got up every day, every morning, looked outside and said, maybe today all my troubles will be over. Maybe today I won't hurt anymore. Maybe today I'll never go to a graveyard again. Maybe today my life on this earth will just be a papers that is now come and gone, I'll be with Jesus. He's going to come and receive us. He said in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you to myself. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? And Jesus gave that great statement, that powerful statement about all what we are as Christians. He said, Thomas, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man, red man, yellow man, black man, white man, Christian, Mohammedan, Confucian, or Janus, or whatever, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Lord Jesus Christ is the gate, the door to heaven. There is no other way. The Apostle Peter in the book of Acts says that we're going to get up and we're going to preach this. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved but the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm so glad, thanks be unto God today, that I'm a Christian believer. I thank God today that I've got a holy Bible in front of me. I thank God today that I'm not going to hell, that I know the truth, I know the way, I know the life, I know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank God today that I've got that blessed hope 
inside my soul, as he said to Titus, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Amen. I'm looking for him to come again. Let me spell out eschatology for just a moment with you this morning because there's so much confusion in the church today. The second advent, first advent of Christ is a past event. It's finished. He came the first time. He came the first time. Only a fool would deny that Christ was here on this earth. But he's coming again. That's where the controversy arises. The Lord Jesus Christ revealed mysteries to the Apostle Paul. He revealed mystery after mystery after mystery as it pertained to the body of Christ. And here's one of the mysteries he revealed to him. He said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment. This mystery he's talking about is when he comes to catch up his bride to meet him in the clouds. We'll not die, he said. We'll be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We call it the rapture. The rapture and the revelation make up the two main parts of the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the rapture itself is in two parts, and this is where the problem comes in. When he comes to catch up his bride to meet him in the clouds, that's you, that's me. When does that happen, preacher? It happens any moment. But I thought the gospel had to be preached. No, it had to be preached anywhere. There's no signs that have to precede the rapture. He could come at any moment and catch us up to meet him in the clouds and in the air. But it's not over. That's just the beginning. For when we go into the tribulation period, we have tribulation saints, we have Jews, we got all this that's happening for seven years, the time of Jacob's trouble on this earth. There's another rapture that takes place during the tribulation period. That's the tribulation saints. So the rapture itself is in two parts. It is us, the first fruits. When we're caught up to meet him in the clouds, the church of the living God, then during the tribulation period, there is a rapture of the saints of God. And in typology, it is in Revelation chapter number 11, when he says to the two witnesses, come up hither. After their bodies have lain in the streets of Jerusalem for three days, he says, come up hither. And they go up, and that's the time when the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And then the revelation. What's that, preacher? In Revelation chapter number 19, the apostle John said, And I saw heaven open. And behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And the armies which were in heaven followed him on white horses, white and clean. They were dressed in robes, linen, and beauty, and righteousness. And they come to make war. Well, when he catches up his saints, he's not making war. When he takes his bride out, there's no war associated with it. It's a mystery. It happens like a night. And when he comes to take up the tribulation saints, no war is involved with it. But when he comes at the rapture, at the revelation, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, he's coming as a man of war. And the Antichrist is going to fight against him. In his ignorance and his arrogance, he'll bring the armies of this earth to meet with the Lord Jesus. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. They'll come and they'll fight against the Holy One of Israel. And when he comes, he comes, my friend, with the armies of heaven with him. And when he comes, there's a battle that takes place. Then another battle that takes place. A battle in the north and a battle in the south. A battle related to the king's highway. A battle as he comes down from the north and as they come up from the south. And it all is consummated at what's called the battle of Armageddon. Armageddon is literally in Hebrew the mountain of Megiddo. R in Hebrew means mountain. Mountain of Megiddo. I've stood at, Mount, at Megiddo. You've got 21 separate layers underneath your feet. 21 distinct buildings of civilizations that go back a long way. Generals have looked at Megiddo, at the plain of Asdralian as it spreads itself out before you. And they've said that this is the most natural battlefield in the world, and it's a marvelous thing. From the Mediterranean Sea in the east, at the west rather, as you move all the way to the east, you've got this huge valley. And it's all coming together at Megiddo. That's a marvelous thing. This is what everybody, when they talk about Armageddon, most folks don't have any real understanding of what they're saying when they say that. That's Armageddon. Armageddon is the valley, is the battle of, at, at, the, at the mountain of Megiddo when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and he comes against the armies of the Antichrist and they clash. Right? Guess who wins? Would you want to fight against God? God Almighty. 
He's coming again. This might be my day. I may leave before the sun goes down naturally as any, as any human being can leave. I don't know that. I don't know how to worry about my heart ticking. I get up here and preach like this, not worry a bit, a bit about my heart. I'd rather leave right now. I'd rather leave right now than to deny him, to turn against him, to apostatize and go out in this world. I'd rather, I'd rather you see me drop behind this pulpit and I'm finished because make no mistake about it, you'll never bury me. <laughs> I'm gone to be with him. I'm gone. You can have my body. I think it's worth about a dollar and a half, isn't it? Two dollars, something like that. <laughs> it's, not enough, it's, not worried, it's not worth enough to bury. <laughs> But you're welcome to it. I can talk to my wife about it. She might make claim on it. Who knows? But uh, I'm gone. But wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful? As I'm up here preaching to you and we're up here talking, we're in this building together, that I look at you and you look at me and we just disappear. Just pow. Gone. Wouldn't that be something? And be caught up with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord? Now listen. You don't go home biting your fingernails. You don't go home, uh, uh, what do they call them, these people who are uh, the di digging holes in the ground, prep uh, preppies, what there's a term for them? <laughs> Preppers, yeah. <clears throat> you're not worried about that because you know at any minute he could come and you're gone. That is if you're right. Are you right? Are you right? And I know many of no doubt many of you are. I mean, I felt the Holy Ghost in this house today. All, are all of you right? Are you ready? You say you, say, you make it sound like it could happen right now, preacher. It can happen right now. <laughs> right this second. Now shut up with this. The Bible said at the twinkling of an eye. They tell us that that means that the time it takes light to hit the back of your eyeball and bounce back out. How long does that take? It happens before you can blink. <laughs> they say light travels at 100 and what is 86,000 miles a second, somewhere in there. Time it takes to bounce off the back of your eye and back out. That's how fast it's over. Boy, that's good. Yes, Hallelujah. I mean, that's not even time to. That's not even time to shout. <laughs> you can start shouting here, and the shout won't get out till you're already halfway to glory. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you're gone. <laughs> that's the way this dispensation ends. Bang! Disappear. Here's a sad thing. What would you do if you were sitting in here this morning and about 80, 90% of the people sitting in here just disappeared and you looked around and there were maybe five or ten people left? That's scary. You'd panic. That's what you'd do. You'd panic. Father, in thy holy name, I look for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. I long for that day, Lord. Jesus, even so come. I pray with John the Apostle, even so come. Lord Jesus, come. In thy blessed, righteous, sweet, holy name I pray. For Jesus' sake I ask it. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. Bless his holy name. In Jesus' name.